Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Most articles about Jean Harlow open with some variation on Before Marilyn Monroe, there was Jean Harlow. It's true, Harlow was Hollywood's first bombshell, a platinum blonde in skin-tight satin who steamed the screen in a run of glossy MGM pictures in the 1930s. Her body made her a sex symbol, her talent made her a star, her death made her a legend. Why Jean Harlow's breath smelled like urine. Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Jean Harlow, the original blonde bombshell. These words could have been written for the flickering stars of fickle 21st century celebrity culture, a warning for all the wannabes attracted to the world of easy come, easy go fame. It comes as a surprise then to learn that they were spoken 75 years ago, and by one of fame's greatest ever victims, the Hollywood sex goddess Jean Harlow. The original blonde bombshell with peroxide platinum locks and a sassy face that sent men wild and women racing to their hairstylist to copy her look is barely remembered now. Not one of the three dozen films she starred in would figure in even the most arcane cinema buff's top 100 list. Yet there was an era when she fought for pole position on the world stage with legendary divas such as Marlena Dietrich and Greta Garbo, Joan Crawford and Tallulah Bankhead and outsparked them all for sheer nerve and sexiness. As a turn-on she even out-itted the it girl herself, her silent screen contemporary Clara Bow. You can see that her early films spotted exactly what it was and that Harlow, as she wafted across the screen in a skimpy dress, had plenty of it. Her obvious lack of acting ability was immaterial. What mattered was that she had the most sensuous figure seen in front of a camera for a long time. She was probably destined always to play the role of a man-eating trollop, but nobody ever starved possessing what she's got. Her talent may have been tiny, but she made up for it with masses of front, in every sense. Brassy and brazen, she married early and often, consorted with gangsters, boxers, band leaders and bisexuals, and never, she maintained, ever wore knickers or a bra, on or off screen. Her big break was in Howard Hughes's Hell's Angels, in which she replaced the original lead silent film star Greta Nissen who spoke with a thick Norwegian accent and therefore couldn't, in the director's mind, transition to the talkies. Hughes's publicity director is credited for coining the moniker Platinum Blonde, says The Atlantic, just as Mary Pickford was designated America's Sweetheart. So successful was the nickname that a 1931 Frank Capra film was renamed Platinum Blonde, especially for the white-haired Jean, even though she was the supporting actress and not the film's leading lady. A string of hit movies followed, including Bombshell, Dinner at Eight, Reckless and Susie. In several films, Jean starred opposite heartthrob Clark Gable, most notably in 1932's Red Dust. She was lecked over by some of Hollywood's most famous producers and hounded continually for her morals by affronted anti-indecency campaigners who dubbed her the filthiest woman ever to have set foot in Hollywood. And at the age of 26 she was indeed a has-been, but in a different way from the prophecy she herself had mouthed when playing the part of yet another good-time girl in one of her films. There would be no being a nobody for the rest of your life for Jean Harlow. She was dead. She had been born as Harleen Carpenter on March 3, 1911, surprisingly on the posh side of the tracks, in a mansion in Kansas City, with a well-off father and an ambitious but nutty mother who never called her by any name except Baby, even when she was a grown woman. Harleen's mother's name was actually Jean Harlow, but after her daughter took on the screen name she began going by Mother Jean. Similarly, Norma Jean would borrow her mother's maiden name of Monroe. Harleen lived in a lavish Kansas City home and summered at her grandparents' 25-room Bonner Springs, Kansas retreat. 
Her parents' divorce in 1922 left Harleen alone with her mother. At age 15, she became very sick from scarlet fever, caused by beta strep bacteria. Penicillin, which kills beta strep, had not yet been discovered. Mama Jean had wanted to make it in Hollywood herself, but was too old, and all her desire for fame was pitched onto her daughter. Mama even offered herself on the casting couch for the pleasure of Randy directors and producers to pave the way for Baby. Not that Baby was a child any more after losing her virginity when she was just 14. At 16, she eloped with a wealthy young stockbroker named Charles McGrew, and they moved to Los Angeles, but it wouldn't last. Mother was propelling her into the lower reaches of Hollywood. Harleen and her new husband moved to Beverly Hills, where she fell into the movies by chance. She was never shy, always ready for a quick flash. There, the teenager's blue eyes, pouting lips and well-formed figure landed her various bit parts. She was spotted by a Fox Film Corporation executive while sitting in a park lot, waiting for an aspiring actress friend. She was invited for an audition and became an extra in a number of early movies, including Why is a Plumber in 1927, Moran of the Marines in 1928, and The Love Parade in 1929. She appeared in three films with Laurel and Hardy and The Saturday Night Kid in 1929, starring Clara Bow, as well as bit parts in seven other movies. Her new career put pressure on her marriage and she and her husband divorced in 1929, she began using her mother's maiden name, Jean Harlow, although this was not legally changed until 1935. She epitomised the dark side of the Hollywood Babylon legend. Her mother was controlling to the point of madness, and her stepfather, a gun-toting pervert who climbed up ladders to spy on his naked sleeping stepdaughter. She herself was often drunk, debauched, and drawn to middle-aged men who let her down in bed, and beat her black and blue, instead of giving her the love she craved. Not knowing any of this, but transfixed and shocked by her daring presence on screen, the public adored her. Her heyday was, as now, a time of economic recession. On the very day she signed her first film contract in October 1929, Wall Street crashed, and America and the world slipped into recession and then depression. But even as the dull queues lengthened, the soup kitchens multiplied, and poverty stalked millions of lives, the antics of Hollywood's finest never faltered. Actors and actresses, directors and producers continued to party, spend, drink, carouse and bed hop, as if nothing mattered beyond Sunset Boulevard. Strangely, outside in the real world, instead of disgust at the star's indulgences in those hard times, there was a fascination on the part of the public as if the reflection of the bright lights could lift the gloom. People lapped up every last titillating detail the gossip columns and the fan magazines dished out. What they were allowed to read about the stars' lives, however, was a heavily blue-penciled account that reflected the family values and upright morality the studios were keen to promote. The secrets of Tinseltown's immorality were concealed, and few of its inhabitants had more secrets worth concealing than Harlow. She became the leading blonde good-bad girl of the early talkies, constantly surrounded by scandal regarding her marriages and the numerous men in her life. She was the original independent Hollywood talking film star. She was rumoured to sleep naked at night and never to wear underpants during the day. She would change clothes for different scenes right on set, instead of wasting time to retreat to her dressing room. Throughout her soon burgeoning career, she was infamous for stripping off on set in front of everyone. Other stars would slip behind a screen, but, to wolf whistles, she shed every stitch in full view before calling for her dresser to bring out her working clothes. She was never shy about proving the point, and would often give reporters a quick flash to show that she was, as she put it, the same colour all over. To some special fans, she sent a cut-off silver curl or two as a keepsake. Crude though all this was, it was just the sort of thing that hypocritical 30s Hollywood, all squeaky clean on the outside but grubby inside, loved. She built on this daring reputation by taking any opportunity to let her untethered breasts tumble out from her blouse and enhance their appearance by icing her nipples so they stood out prominently. 
None of this ever emerged on screen as such, of course. It wouldn't have been allowed. But her slattishness was soon her trademark, and it brought in millions of box office dollars for her unscrupulous studio bosses. She herself did less well financially. She was consistently underpaid compared with other big stars. Harlow's private life was chaotic and unhappy. At age 21, she married Paul Byrne, an MGM executive who was rumoured to be more interested in men than women. Two months after their wedding, Byrne's gunshot-riddled bloody body was found in the dressing room of their Beverly Hills home. The police were called only after Louis B. Mayer had spent several hours in the house, presumably because he was trying to protect his famous movie star. After Jean Harlow was first accused and then exonerated of killing her husband, the official verdict was that Byrne had committed suicide. After Byrne's death, Harlow had an affair with boxer Max Bayer, whose wife threatened her with a lawsuit for adultery. Officials at MGM were afraid the public would lose interest in a female movie star who was an adulteress as well as having been married to a homosexual man who was murdered by his lover. They arranged a marriage between Harlow and cinematographer Harold Rosson. Since it wasn't really a marriage of love, they peacefully divorced eight months later. Harlow met actor William Powell in 1935, her co-star in Reckless and Libeled Lady. She wanted to marry him then and there. Powell did not want to marry at that time because it was right after his divorce from comedian Carol Lombard. Harlow responded to Powell's refusal to marry her by meeting Clark Gable to see who could drink whom under the table. In 1936, Powell made her pregnant. She wanted to stop acting, marry him and bring up their child. But Powell did not want children. Her mother forced her to have an abortion and she never told Powell about it. In 1937, Powell gave her a sapphire ring and they were engaged. She suddenly became seriously ill in late May 1937. She began the filming of Saratoga with her best friend Clark Gable. She had always been on a diet to control her weight, but now she was gaining weight. She looked and felt sick, and her skin turned a greyish colour. One scene required Clark to pick her up and throw her onto a couch. She was breathing so hard and sweating so much that they stopped the scene and the doctor, who was called, sent her to the hospital to find out what was wrong with her. However, her mother brought Jean home and cared for her herself for a week. On the eighth day she became delirious and was admitted to Good Samaritan Hospital. She was incorrectly diagnosed with an inflamed gallbladder. Clark visited her and noticed that her breath smelt like urine. When he told this to her doctors, they immediately changed her diagnosis from gallbladder disease to the more obvious diagnosis of kidney failure. Her breath smelled of ammonia because her kidneys could not get rid of ammonia as normal kidneys do, so she had to breathe it out through her lungs. Her fatigue, nausea, belly pain, grey skin, fever, shortness of breath, laboured breathing, heavy sweating and swollen face and legs were all caused by kidney failure. She died eight days after leaving the movie set. According to her obituary in the New York Times, the actress had suffered from poor health for a year, including an acute case of sunburn, a throat infection and influenza. She also contracted scarlet fever and meningitis as a teenager, which permanently weakened her health. After doctors diagnosed uremic poisoning the weekend before, according to the Times, Miss Harlow soon responded favourably to treatment and was thought well on the road to recovery when she lapsed into a coma last night. She died the next day, June 7, 1937, at a hospital in Hollywood, California. Powell was at Harlow's bedside when she died along with her mother, stepfather and cousin. Harlow's final film, Saratoga, was released posthumously. Another actress served as her stand-in for several scenes so that the movie could be completed. In 1990, 53 years after her death, her medical records were open to the public. They showed that at age 15 she suffered from scarlet fever, an infection with a beta strep, group A bacteria that causes the skin to turn red, Beta strep produces a toxin that damages the kidneys to cause glomerulonephritis and the heart to cause rheumatic fever. Throughout her lifetime she had recurrent strep infections in her throat, mouth and skin that damaged her kidneys and heart. Nowadays anyone who has beta strep would be immediately put on penicillin 
and children who have had rheumatic fever or glomerulonephritis are often kept on penicillin continuously through their youth to prevent beta strep infections. The weight gain that she worked so hard to control was not caused by excess body fat. It was caused by kidneys that could not get rid of extra fluid to swell her legs and body. The incredible fatigue that she suffered was not caused by emotional problems. It was caused by the toxins that her kidneys failed to clear. Some of her irrational behaviour was probably also caused by toxins accumulating in her body. In 1937, doctors had no effective treatment for kidney failure. There were no dialysis machines, kidney transplants or antibiotics such as penicillin that could have saved her life. Like the best Hollywood legends, she lived fast and died young. But it is hard to resist the conclusion that she was a victim. So many people, most notably her mother, had tried to live their lives through hers, to manipulate and control her, all in the pursuit of fame. In the end, sadly, it was the death of her. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Jean Harlow? Jean swiftly became a national and international sex symbol and, despite much criticism of her acting ability, her popularity among movie fans was immense.